to Comic News, episode 170. I am one of your hosts, Chris, alongside Mike. What's very, up, Mike? The very recently passive-aggressive Mike. <laughs> uh, no interview today, folks. We're just going just gonna to talk, talk a little bit. Um, sometimes I'd rather just talk to Chris and have interviews with certain people, you know, so here we are. <laughs> Um, before I get too much into that, what's going on, Chris? How you been? Oh, you know, my cat knocked over a bunch of pop figures, so now I'm picking them up. And yeah, uh, I was wondering, like, where did everything go? <laughs> He's just did a clean swipe of your entire desk. <laughs> he has this new fun thing. Uh, for anyone watching video, you can see there's a window right next to me that I put mm-hmm. a Marvel flag in front of. Um, and he likes to climb up there because he knows it'll knock everything over and piss me off and then mm-hmm. let him outside. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. He's like, I need freedom. This is what this is my path to freedom. Knock all of his shit over, and then I get to be. I get to look, be. I'm like, all you gotta do is ask, bud. Like, <laughs> yeah, like a meow would work, you know? No, like, not even. No, you're just, okay. You're just gonna fucking throw everything on the floor. All right, whatever. Um, yeah, not a whole lot going on here. Just uh, finished up Narcos. Um. I, uh, I, I, I just got done with a conversation with a friend and, uh, I don't know, someone was like bugging him and I was like, you could just kill him. And then I was like, wait, I've been watching way too much Narcos. <laughs> 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 that anybody doesn't know, when you watch Narcos, you find out the way that the Colombian cartel deals with any problem, they kill the person. Like, it's not even like. You didn't, like, back in the day, and I'm sure it was this bad. I mean, I I can't even imagine it wasn't this bad. But, like, if you even thought about crossing the cartel, like, if they even thought, like, you you just, like, they were in a bad mood that day. They're like, oh, you're dead. They're just going to shoot you. Like, we'll find someone else to replace you. Just, like, some of those guys were so paranoid. I mean, with good reason, the the whole country's looking for them. But, like, several countries. But, anyways, I just, you know, I I actually, I think of, of it like a, a Mandalorian prequel because you know um, the lead actor who plays the Mandalore is oh, in it yes. um, and it's kind of like his rise to how he became like the head DEA agent for for all the crazy stuff that he did with the Colombian cartel um, Pedro Pascal is the actor but so now now that the series is finished I'm like oh and then he goes off to become the Mandalorian <laughs> and a bounty hunter because he he resigns at the DEA, so it's, it actually fits pretty well if you watch them consecutively. I feel like uh, everything you just described is how my uh, place of uh, business would like to handle us when we get uh, mouthy, <laughs> but there's laws against this type of thing. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's almost like there's laws in place to so that you know legitimate businesses and distributors can't act like the Colombian cartel when you are. Out of line. <laughs> uh, it's almost like there's a justice system. Oh boy. Okay, now we're towing a line that I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> so let's just jump. Let's into talk the... about freedoms, Mike. Yeah. No. No. Oh. Not go there. Today. Uh, <laughs> this always happens. Right, we're moving on. Um, we got a little bit of news. Uh, we got some sad news today, so we're trying to just be as upbeat as we can. But I, this news this week was pretty sad. But. Uh, first, we'll start off with the good news. There's a new trailer for The Boys Season 2. Um, September 4th, too. That's pretty soon. It comes out, right? I mean, I I wasn't expecting that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember reading that they said it wasn't going to be like too delayed because of Corona, that they had most of it shot and ready. So Yeah. And I think a lot of those a lot of those shows where they, it's really heavy in costumes and stuff, I... I can't imagine for budget reasons, like you got to spend four or five hours on makeup. You're not going to shoot scenes, you know, predicting there will be another season. So I think it just makes sense. Yeah. And if you did most of the shots, like it's, it's one of those things with coronavirus. I mean, with your work has noticed this and I know a lot of people out there have noticed this, like people don't necessarily have to go into an office to do their job. Right. And I think that's true with a lot of film stuff. Like, everything's done on computers now, so you could do most... Of, if you have proper equipment at home, you could do it at home very easily, so... Mm-hmm. And a show like this, it's not like we're CGIing a giant, uh, let's say, dark side um, mm-hmm. <laughs> into the shot. Pretty relevant. It's uh, mostly just, you know, tricks with the 
to get rid of certain wires and stuff like that. So I could see, yeah, I could see why it didn't get delayed too bad. But yeah. I'm happy because I want something new to watch. Too bad it's like three months away. Yeah. Um, for me, the dark season three and the final season um, they announced. So, which is great because we're not to not to spoil dark too much, but I, it, you know, last couple of seasons focused on time travel. The third season, we get to another, maybe a little more than time travel. I'm not trying to spoil anything, but we push another scientific boundary and explore that. So space travel. Uh, no, maybe dimensional travel. I don't know. We'll find out. Is, um, is this the Rick and Morty prequel. Yeah, pretty much. No, it's 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 like a it's a more serious German uh, Stranger Things, but it's it's fantastic show. The writing is like the best writing I've ever seen in a TV show. Um, so I'm going to be finishing that up. I cannot wait. I, it's and for anybody that's just getting into the show, the best way to watch it is all three episodes in a row because there it's it's there's like all these lines that connect characters and like some sometimes it gets tough. Like I'll have to watch a recap before season three just to remember who's who. Like who had a relationship with who? Um, it's a really good show, though, man. So I want to point out that like two episodes ago, I said I was going to uh, try to watch Star Girl. Yeah, I remember that. Mm-hmm. And uh, my last comment of I have nothing new to watch, and I still haven't brought myself to watch Star Girl should say all you need to know about. Yeah. How good those previews were. <laughs> yeah, I I had a feeling when he told me that I was like, "There's no way he's gonna." There's a and few then... times I've like scrolled over it and been like. Uh, <laughs> not today but now you got doom patrol what the first few episodes of season two are out i gotta check those out yeah i want to um, check those out too because i remember I, liking yeah. the last season yeah and i it was fun i mean they weren't taking themselves too seriously plus brendan frazier is just awesome uh and then well i guess we'll just hop over the movie news jason momoa's instagram he's trying to tease everybody that the Zack snyder cut is half cut of uh Justice League is happening, so he posts a little, a little clip of Wonder Woman, uh, in some like Aztec runes, and you see like a drawing of Darkseid, and then they show Darkseid like with all the CGI ships and everything. That's pretty cool. Um, from the scene that they do it in, I guess it's instead of Jesse Eisenberg in the jail cell like talking about bells ringing. And like snot coming out of his nose, and I remember the, like I'm like, wow, that's the shot you decided to keep with the the snot running down his nose, but whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I'm cool. I, I, if anything, we're gonna get more like comic book stuff, you know, and less of that Russian family that was hiding from the parodies, <laughs> which is almost like what you want out of a comic book movie. I don't know. I'm not an expert here, but. It's kind of like watching a Godzilla movie and then having oh, to God. deal with humans the whole time. I've been trying so hard. Like, you know, I, I Sunday nights, I, I love to sit down. Sunday nights is like winding down for the week, going back into the work week. I watch a movie, right? And I, so many Sundays, I I keep retexting friends like that have seen the new Godzilla movie. I'm like, are you sure the new one was bad? And they're like, don't watch it. And I'm like, Ugh. like, really? There's like, there's some good parts, but don't watch it. And I'm like, all right. I don't know. If you if you take out all the parts where they deal with people, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good movie. I mean, there's things in there I really liked about it, but it it's falls in that usual trap of like, well, no one's going to relate to it. There's no humans in it. It's like I don't care. Godzilla <laughs> fight three headed <laughs> dragon. That's what I want. I'm not watching a giant lizard movie to relate to the giant lizard. Yeah, it's <laughs> and and it's like. I will. I will say the Japanese ones. I gotta watch Shin Godzilla because I heard that is actually really good. And I was so fed up with it that I just I rented like Godzilla versus Destroya, the original, on Amazon Prime. And I was like, now this. I'm I'm glad I watched this instead because this is a Godzilla movie. Yeah. But good whatever. stuff. Um, some really cool news came out last week. I was very excited about it. It's uh, it's prompted me to want to rewatch the original Batman. Um, Michael Keaton reportedly is going to be returning as Batman, um, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan is going to reportedly return as Thomas Wayne in the Flash movie. So interesting. Now, 
We know is is the Flash movie still titled Flashpoint, right? To my knowledge, yes. So, <laughs> what if the Flash movie just turns into like just the Batman, the multiverse Batman movie? <laughs> Well, there's a there's a thing going on about trying to get um, Ben Affleck to come back for this movie as well. Oh, he won't. So here's here's my theory. Here is this is gonna be the Flashpoint movie. Yeah, Michael Keaton's come back. They say he's gonna come back and he's gonna play a Nick Fury like role, which is stupid. Um, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> what I want to happen is do the do a Flashpoint movie. Do the whole Jeffrey D. Morgan Batman thing. And then bring bring back the note at the end of the movie to Keaton. So you can have that moment at the end of Flashpoint where his dad's you know leaves him the note. Mm-hmm. And then that should set up Batman Beyond and possibly Justice League Beyond. Mm. At the very yeah. least, Batman Beyond. Batman Beyond, yeah, please. And then use this to reorganize things. Yep. And earn a Justice League movie down the line. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like bring the new Batman in, bring Shazam in, like keep the things that worked, bring the new stuff in, and realign everything and move forward. I, so I'm guessing, I'm guessing this. Bruce Wayne, the, uh, this Michael Keaton belongs to the same universe that the Jeffrey Dean Morgan Thomas Wayne is going to belong to, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for Flashpoint, right? Well, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was Thomas Wayne in Batman v Superman. You're right. So I think that's the Thomas Wayne they're going for. Oh. I could be wrong there. I, my feeling was it was going to be that. Or I, I thought he would just be playing Thomas Wayne from Earth Two. That's that is Batman. See, I I was going with the whole Flashpoint story arc where he re does something to the timeline. Oh yeah, I and everything's that. fucked up. And yeah. Thomas Wayne is Batman, and right. Bruce is the one that died, and Martha is Joker. Spoiler alert. Right, um, but and what I'm saying is, like, Bruce is dead. Then how do we get Michael Keaton? <laughs> Well, you, yeah, <laughs> right. Because if they're like, that means we're gonna get more than one universe. Is what I'm trying to get at here. Like, even if they change the timeline, we still got to get another. Like, there's this Bruce Wayne. Unless they change the timeline back, like the end of the movie, Jeffrey Dean Morgan sacrifices himself, and then we get old Michael Keaton instead of Ben Affleck or something. <laughs> they're just like swap. There you go. Yeah. Now I'm confused. I, I didn't even put that together. Yeah. Yeah. My actually my my original thought was they were gonna come back and uh Michael Keaton was gonna get the note. Like he was gonna come back, reset everything. Right. And then Michael Keaton was gonna get the note and be old Batman. Mm. But then where does that put sparkly Batman? <laughs> I don't know. They just do it. I don't care. Yeah. As long as I get a Batman Beyond movie out of this, that's all I care about. <laughs> I'm just happy Michael Keaton's back, honestly. Yes, I uh, you know Michael Keaton. That movie is has its flaws, but is so good. Um, mm-hmm. There's even talks of like Jack Nicholson coming back as Joker, which is weird. Um, but I'll take it. Weird. I mean, I don't. At this point, this movie is such a shit show. Like, there's been 50 different scripts. They don't know who the hell's Batman anymore. <laughs> They're trying to get Ben Affleck back. Like, the only thing that would be great about that is if that somehow turned into, like, the second Batman Beyond movie. They just remade Return of the Joker. Oh, man. <laughs> and it was Jack Nicholson. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be awesome. Dude, I, I don't know. They're, they could honestly go anywhere with this. But it it's just funny to me. They call up Ben Affleck to be like, we want you back as Batman. But no, no, no. You're not doing a Batman <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna be in the Flash movie. He's like, what? What do you mean? Okay. Well, that's a that's a fan thing. The fans yeah, are know. trying to get him to do it. I don't I'm, think he'll come back. I think he's done. Considering that that whole part of his life brought him back to rehab and everything like that, I don't think. I think putting on the cowl for him isn't that easy. You know what I mean? Like and he he's been suspiciously quiet through this whole release of Snyder Cut thing. Yeah. 
Like he said a few times, but he's but not th- as big as like. I think it's more that. for his personal recovery. Like he doesn't want to acknowledge that. You know, he's he's been having some issues, especially like after the Justice League movie. So, do you think Anyways. he just like gets triggered every time someone screams Martha at him? I maybe, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure he gets a lot of hate for it. Um, very sad news. Uh, beloved film director Joel Schumacher uh, directed Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. He's passed away at age 80 after a year-long battle of cancer. Man, this guy was such a visionary. Uh, and, you know, those for what they are, those movies are a lot of fun. I grew up watching those movies. And, yeah. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Everybody freeze. <laughs> Everybody chill out. I love those movies, man. I don't even care. They're they're funny. I mean, I always like to make fun of bat nipples, but that's just because yeah. nipples are hilarious. I know they're awesome. Um, the, the one the one thing I will say about Schumacher, in all seriousness, Lost Boys is an amazing movie that he directed. Yep. And I don't know how that isn't a bigger success than it was. That was one of the best vampire movies of all time. I love that movie. Classic, sure. Um. And yeah, it's sad. Age eighty, he had a really shitty version of cancer too. He had like a, it was a pancreatic duct Uh cancer or something. It was some weird form of cancer that just sounds like it hurt a lot. And fuck that. But uh, good for him. He did a a ton in his life. um, And I'm, you know, we'll celebrate him for a long time coming. Yeah, I'm glad that. I mean, we have these movies to always reflect on and. Um, they were they for sure are like when you watch Batman and Robin, it is like it is like you you take the timeline of of pop culture and and where we were in those years, and you can just like clip clip out that movie and be like, this is a reference of just how how things were. Like, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger was such a big influence in the movies. Yeah, you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in any movie, anybody who's gonna go see it. Um, probably more so than today, and I mean, Jim just, Carrey as the Jim Riddler. Carrey as the Riddler. I mean, like Jim Carrey was a huge like what 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 movies is Jim Carrey making now? You know what I mean? Like that was like at the time it was like oh my god, <laughs> like this movie is gonna be insane. Like you're putting Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jim Carrey in the same thing, and Jim Carrey as the Riddler was. I mean, that guy was. I, that wasn't the worst part of the movie. We'll say that. That was prime Jim Carrey too. Yeah, that was like. Before he really went off the wagon and started yeah. to pretend to be serious, and did all owns like a paints paints pictures all day and has like a giant depression beard. It's things gotten kind of weird. Yeah, but now but, he's Doctor Robotnik, and all things are better with the world. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I mean, he left a legacy behind, and yeah, you can go back and watch those movies. I'm probably going to go back and watch them again just because I'll, I'll never forget the scene where like. Batman and Robin get kicked over on the ice. They fall down in the, on the ice rink, and they they click their shoes together, and ice skates pop out. I thought sh- that shit was so cool when I was a kid. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so <laughs> Why did I think of that? I, I was told uh, like an anecdote about uh, making that movie, too. The one thing with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is his mouth glows in that movie. Yeah. So when they did that, they actually had to put a device in his mouth to make it do that. Really? And it was constantly leaking battery acid. Oh, my God. So if you go back and watch that movie and see how great his performance is, thinking that he was constantly having to spit out battery acid and had this device in his mouth, he should have won an Oscar. Oh, That's my God. Like, it, <laughs> with that in mind, that whole performance is way better. Yeah, I, I appreciate it just so much more now. Um, and yeah, with that, we're gonna we're gonna hop into the comic book news here. So, Mike, I got a quick comic book fact to give you. Ooh. So last week we talked about Dark Knight's Death Metal number one. Yeah. We were trying to figure out who the Batman was in the red suit with the black bat. Yeah. Scott Snyder uh, recently confirmed who it was on Twitter. And the Batman is named the Beyonder. Because that is an evil Terry McGinnis. Oh. Wow. That is awesome. 
Wow. I'm so happy I found that out. That makes that issue 20 times better. Because... That is... Oh, man. He, you knew he had that in his head. Like, Oh, that is awesome. I'm going to go back and flip through the book now again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that fact. Yeah. I want to share it evil, with evil Terry McGinnis, man. Oh, that's awesome. So now I need that story. On the beyond. Of- yeah, right. Where's that? That It must be... It's got to be in the little, you know, the mini story uh, mini stories they're doing there has to be how, how do you leave that story out there's no way yeah the legend of the dark knights that oh. it, yeah dude dinosaur batman evil terry mcginnis take my money i'm more excited for those in the main story who gives a shit about the main story <laughs> i don't care anyways i do care i'm just kidding but that that is awesome and i love the name too to be honest they're just like they're like what would the fans want i don't know evil terry mcginnis yes give me that and i also got confirmation too about the invisible chat oh so, so, a person who reads Wonder Woman on the regular has told me that the Invisible Jet does show up quite a bit. Okay. It, it is in canon because although Wonder Woman can fly, mm-hmm. she doesn't have... This is weird comic book science, but she doesn't have the Superman-ish ability to fly where she can just like go wherever she wants. Yeah. She can basically hover and like move around in the battlefield. So, she still needs the Invisible Jet to get to places. Oh, so, so the invisible jet of... is a thing in continuity still. So it's a different type of flying. Yes. Mm. Well, I did You know, why did we think of that, Chris? You fly around battlefields, but not across continents. Now I understand. This is why I still go to the comic shop, man. I get these great conversations. These are the about... things, you know. Yeah, that's what I miss about being in a comic shop. That's the stuff you talk about, like, and like, can Wolverine die of cancer or something like that? <laughs> I remember having that discussion one time. It's like, who the hell talks about these things? Only at the comic shop, honestly. Um, anyways, with that, we'll jump into the comic book news. That's awesome. Uh, DC is teaming up with Big Bang Theory star and real life PhD, uh, Mayim Bialik on a book named Flash Facts. And, uh, I'm trying to think of her name. I'm trying to remember if that was, wait, Character. let me look that up. Is that Amy? Amy Farrah Fowler is actually a PhD, I'm pretty sure. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, that, called, yep. that is Amy Farrah Fowler, yes. Okay, yeah. So she's actually a PhD. I remember that from watching the show. So it's it's called Flash Facts. Uh, the middle grade graphic novel will use DC superheroes to help teach kids about STEM, which is the uh, acronym for like science, engineering, mathematics. So that's actually pretty interesting. I like that idea. Yeah, it's pretty really cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, Coming out in November of next year, um, or not November, February of next year, sorry. Um, and it's like 10 bucks, so I'm yeah. definitely going to buy it for my boys. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great idea. I mean, I think it is. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sean Murphy, so like, man, this, this has been like an up and down for me. Sean Murphy's returning to the Batman, <laughs> the White Knight universe. Yay! With a Harley Quinn spinoff. Ugh. Oh. The series will launch in October and is co-written with his wife, Katana Collins, and is drawn by Matteo Scalera. So, uh, so no Murphy art, and it's focusing on Harley Quinn. Hmm. Hmm. I might, I might check the first couple issues out, just because... So, yeah, this was, like, the whole thing of this was news a while ago, where he's going to do, like, spin-off books, but he wasn't yeah. going to draw them. Right. Um, I'll check it out, because I like this version of Harley Quinn. Yeah, it, and she was yeah right, and I was gonna get at that. Yeah. I I didn't not I did not like her so. But yeah, and he's still like he's still plotting out the story. His wife is just writing the dialogue. Yep, it fits within his overall story. I'm down with it. Um, it's not like it wouldn't be the first time I'd enjoy a Harley Quinn book. There was you know Harleen I really like so. Mm-hmm. Yep. It could happen twice. Yeah, I think. I mean, there's really. <laughs> John Murphy, I mean, most of the stuff he's written I've enjoyed, so I can't I can't not try it. Yeah, I, I can't wait to get my hands on that book Plot Holes that he's doing. Um, this this makes sense. DC announced that they're postponing Event Leviathan Checkmate to an undisclosed date. Yeah, because everything happening, it's got to fit right. back in with continuity, so it's probably going to be later this year. And I can't imagine, like, I don't know. Do, do people really 
care with Dark Knight Metal happening right now, you know? Like, uh, Yeah, like, I'm going to read it, but it's right. not like I was breaking down the door for this book. Yep. Uh, Marvel has announced the first comic to come out on their, their new partnership with Warhammer 40K. Uh, this big, big, big following for tabletop games. Um, 40K is, you know, just like Magic, new sets coming out all the time. Big money sink, lots of players. It's called, uh, it's titled Warhammer 40K, Marnius Calgar, written by Kyrian Kill, with art by Jason Burroughs. So that's, that's autocorrect. That's Kieran Gillen. Oh, Kieran Gillen. <laughs> oh, I was gonna, I was gonna say I've never heard of Kieran Kill, but Kieran Gillen, yes, is a is actually a well renowned comic book writer. That changes everything. Okay, they're putting Kieran Gillen on this book. That's crazy. Apparently, I was reading that Kieran Gillen's like a huge Warhammer fan. Oh, that's awesome. So I like he wrote a whole post about how like when they made the announcement that they got the license for this that he yeah. demanded to be on these books. That's so cool. So I'll say this, I, it's not for me, but for Warhammer fans, you got a true die in the wool fan of this thing working on it. It's awesome. And, and a great, a great writer. writer. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> We think alike. It's like we we've been doing the <laughs> podcast. Like I okay, not I was like here and cut. At first, you know, it was like oh, they're just putting some new up and coming no name writer on the book. So that makes sense. But like now, okay, wow, yeah, that's gonna be some good content. There's so much lore to that universe. It's with all the races and factions, and it's I. Awesome. I was reading, this is the most Warhammer 40k knowledge I've ever gained in my life, because mm -hmm. I thought the game looked cool when I was younger, but it was, I don't like painting things, so. Um, Same. <laughs> yep. But, uh, yeah, apparently, like, this character is a big deal in the universe, like, he's one of the most renowned characters, and that's mm -hmm. why they're starting with him. Interesting. That's cool. So, yeah, let's, I won't read it, I'm like, I'm gonna be honest with yeah, you, I'm not, gonna I'm not gonna read it, but. <laughs> I'm really happy for the the fan base that this is yeah. happening. I mean, if I've read I've read the Magic the Gathering comics, and I think those are fantastic. I think IDW has published those. I've read the Dota comics published by um, Dark Horse, and if there was more of those, I know I would I would be reading all of them. So like, I get it. The Dark Souls comics, I'm a huge Dark Souls, but like, yeah, I just the 40k. I know there's a big fan base for it, so good for them. They got something to read. Uh. And then we're going to um, end on another... Well, we'll talk about the comics we read, but we have some more sad news. Longtime artist Joe Sano uh, has passed away, age 93. Very long life, so there's something to be celebrated there. Joe is best known for his work with Marvel, and he worked with Stan Lee as an anchor. So this guy was at the dawn of it all, you know? Yes. He was there with, with all the big-name Marvel books. With Stan Lee, part of something, you know, building the foundation for these characters that are, uh, you know, well renowned today and even on the big movie screen. So, yeah. and he was with Marvel before they were Marvel, working timely. Yeah, um, just crazy. Yeah. That's dude's, nuts. dude's been around forever, and he he passed away with his family. Apparently, yep. they wouldn't say what it was, which that's no one's business but their own if they don't want to share it. Yep. Um, but yeah, long, long fuck if. If I'm still 93 and, like, not a vegetable, I'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> like, if I make it that far and I'm not just in shitty condition, I will be a happy man. So, well, I mean, I don't know. They see the, the person's been born this generation that'll live to be 150, so. That's definitely not me. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, I'm depressed enough, so let's... Uh... <laughs> Let's talk about what we read. Get me out of this depression. Get me into the comic book universe. Um, I had quite a few books here. I'm just going to start off. Good week. Yeah. Um, it's not every week you get a new Jeff Lemire book, you know, so that's always good. Uh, I'm going to catch up on stuff that I've read that I was supposed to read. Batman 92 and 93. Um Man, you know, if I had a dollar for every time, I wish that they wouldn't make Joker the main villain of every Batman story arc. I don't know how many times I've told you that, Chris. So, uh, Batman 92, 93, you know, James Tinian the fourth is writing it. Um, I mean, long story short, Batman's been, he's like, he's fighting through, he's fighting through the city with Deathstroke 
the Riddler, um, the Riddler shut down Gotham and has turned the city into like a crossword puzzle. He finds the Riddler because he's Batman. Um, there was a there's a really cool moment. There's some cool moments, even though it's like okay, the story's been done before. But the Bat Train shows up in the subway. Like they need to travel via subway, and the Bat Train shows up, and Deathstroke's like, really? Is that a Bat Train? Like, so that was pretty cool. Um, so that ninety two ends with like Batman finding the the designer, the new villain, sitting in his Bruce Wayne's office because he knows, hey, I know you're Bruce Wayne. I know who Batman is. Cut to the next issue. Um, Catwoman and Harley Quinn have been on a mission to steal, um, to get like the bank accounts from all the richest people in Gotham, and come to find out, like, it, they've been coerced to actually steal Bruce Wayne's wealth somehow. Um, come to find out, the designer isn't even a, a, a live, a living person. It's just like a skeleton, and Joker's behind it all. So, shocking. Um, Yep, he steals Batman's fortune, and Deathstroke, you know, wakes back up because Batman had knocked him out. Deathstroke wakes back up, stabs him in the leg, and then uh, we see Harley Quinn and Catwoman are killed. So, I don't really know. Well, Harley gets, like, shot and, like, thrown in in the sewers, so I'm guessing she's going to live. And then they show Catwoman's dead, like, sitting there shot. So, I, and, like, Batman's, like, He's been betrayed, you know. He, they tell him the Catwoman's dead, and so he's standing there with a sword shoved in his quad. And Joker's like, "Aha! I'm behind it all." You know, it's really cool that they, if they're actually going to kill some of these characters off, maybe that'd be interesting. But uh, it's hard for me to really just. I'm just. I'm so. I'm so over the Joker being done this way. And I'm going to talk about another book. That yeah. Involves, yeah. I- Real quick, I I think it's a cool idea to have Joker steal his fortune and like right. bring Batman. I'm interested in that story, right? But I'm with you. Like the curse of Batman is Joker. Yeah. The fact that everybody wants to do a Joker story, and it's like you can do. I think that's. I mean, I know Tom King did do a Joker story, kind right. of, but at least with his run, a majority of it was like Bane is the big bad, right? And yeah. he went away from that trope of like it's got to be Joker behind everything. Uh, don't reveal the mat. It's like it was like a Scooby Doo reveal. Like oh, yeah. it was Joker the whole time. So uh, I wish more. Yeah. I wish more creators would go down that. Like there's there's great Batman villains, right. and yes, there's Joker. But like do a couple stories, then do the Joker. Don't just do the Joker every time. It's just it's yeah. yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> um, and then. So the way the way it should be true, like I don't mind Joker and Elseworlds stories. So we'll talk about Batman: The Smile Killer, number one by Jeff Lemire. Really like this book. And is this the follow up to um, Killer Smile? Yes. Right. Okay. So really interesting issue. Um, basically, they they paint Batman as he's psychotic and all the things that he knows about himself like the villains and the joker and all these people are fake like they never happened um so that we we kind of go in and out of that they they go to his past where he's watching he's a child watching like this clown show and it's supposedly like the joker running the clown show um later in the issue we find out that like the clown starts coursing him to like do these evil things and the reveal is that like it brainwashes him to kill his father like he shoots his dad right um but in and out you like you don't really know if it's real or not uh by the end of it he he's convinced that he's he's being you know tricked so he breaks out of the um the cycle and there's cool stuff too like the uh commissioner gordon is like the head psychiatrist so, like, you know, he's like, Commissioner Gordon's a police chief. He's like, no, it's your head psychiatrist. So they do stuff like that to where you're like, maybe this is true. But then he breaks out of the Batman. There's a really cool scene. He breaks out of the, um, uh, he's in Arkham, I believe, right? Yeah. Breaks out of Arkham, and he sees the bat signal. But then he ru- he starts running, and then the bat signal disappears. So it's like, they still won't let the reader know if it's real or not. So you're kind of going along for the ride. And Jeff Lemire does a really good job of that without like spoon feeding you things, you know, um, it's just how he is as a writer, but, 
Yeah, it's we talked about this with uh, Batman last night on Earth, where there was a story arc where it was Bruce and Arkham, and all, all of the villains were like nurses or people in Arkham yeah. that he was like making into. I I love that idea. I, I wish someone to explore it further. And that was when I'm reading this. What I was getting out of it was kind mm-hmm. of the idea that maybe I mean Bruce Wayne is insane, but yeah. so maybe he's insane and like this whole thing is created in his head. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they never really tell you whether it is or isn't, which is really great. And they kind of go back. They they don't kind of they go back to events from Killer Smile mm-hmm. and basically explain them away because Bruce thinks that he did these things as Batman. Right. And the guy from that story arc is in there with him and goes, that wasn't Batman. Like that was right. so, so yeah, I, yeah, I thought this was an awesome Batman story. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, I highly suggest people pick it up. Yeah. Jeff Lemire, man, he can write a story. That's for sure. Um, uh, and, yep. Sorry. I love Andrew Sorrentino's Batman as well. Yeah, the art in that was fantastic. The art is the art is so fitting for that type of story. I think, um, yeah, for sure. It's not your run of the mill like muscles Batman punching. So, yeah, it's interesting. I like the and it falls under the black label, right? So you know, DC doing more cool stuff with that black label. Yeah. Brand. Um, the uh, Strange Adventures number two. I read that you had talked about it last week, but the follow up, I I. I'm at the point where it's like, you know, the Tom King book, like, I just want to get to the meat and potatoes, you know, like, all right, two issues talking about if he's a bad dude, if he's lying, we kind of know that he's lying. So, all right, let's figure out why he's lying. You know, third issue, it's, it's a 12 issue series. So let's start picking up the pace here. You know what I mean? Like, I want to hear more. Um, yeah. My big critique of that was that I thought that could have been part of issue one. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like we we pretty much ended no further ahead of issue one on issue two. Well that and like what they were doing with uh Mr. Terrific, I'm just like after a few pages of it, I got really frustrated with it. I just stopped reading the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, some of them weren't even English. I'm like, I get it. He's like quizzing himself because he's the smartest man in the world. Yeah. But like Um still I'm I'm still in it to see what's going to happen there. Plus, you know, Batman's involved, so how am I not going to read it? <laughs> uh, Suicide Squad number six, man. This book is so good. Uh, it's a Tom Taylor Suicide Squad. There's a there's a funny interaction with they they hire this like retired Arkham uh, Asylum doctor to take the bombs out of their necks because you know the last thing was they they fought with Locke and they they found out the the person behind everything was. Um, uh, was not Ray Palmer. It was Ted Cord was behind everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, you know, Harley's like, yeah, this is a doctor. And I like this Harley in the Suicide Squad. They're, they're writing, Tom Taylor is writing her really well. Uh, of like, oh, they're like, is this the doctor that, is this the patient that escaped and killed people? Or is this like the retired doctor? She's like, oh, I can't remember. And then there's a funny, there's a funny scene where like Batman shows up and he, like he's late and Suicide Squad gets away, but he's like, he calls in the, the cops and he's like, "Yeah, this is the this is the one that got away and stabbed a bunch of people because the doctor that's taking the bombs out of the neck tries to betray them, and so they have to like get out of there because there's a bounty for all the Suicide Squad members." So, um, Batman starts chasing the uh, the Suicide Squad, and so Deadshot stays behind because he, him and Harley have found out that they have had pardons from their last time being in the Suicide Squad, and nobody ever told them like they were already free to go and so like Deadshot stays behind to fight Batman and uh, they rescued a dog from that evil doctor too he's like give me the dog because Batman won't fight me if I'm holding a dog so he tries to like there's a scene where he's like holding a dog and Batman doesn't want to fight him and then he shows him that he's been pardoned and he's like um, he's like yeah you don't like to break the law so there's like a really funny scene of like um, him and him and Batman like standing next to each other at the end of the fight and he's like Batman goes to leave and he's like, "Where's my car?" And the Suicide Squad member steals the car, <laughs> and he's like, "He's like, do you want me to give you a ride home?" So it was a funny interaction. It looks like Deadshot's gonna try to um, rebuild his relationship with his daughter, and so he's might not be. But there's there's so many other Suicide Squad members that it's that's fine. But there was it was cool to see that interaction between him and Batman. Um, it was written really well, and um, I'm I'm curious to see where where this is gonna go. 
uh, I think it's it's been a great suicide. I it's very cinematic too. Like I can see this being you know part of like James Gunn's uh, run at it. And then my last book, Rogue Planet number two by Colin Bunn. Um, that space horror book. I love it. Uh, it's really good. And basically, you know, we get this team on the planet with these weird. The, the first issue stops with them interacting with like these drones, or like they're they almost think they're like feelers that this giant being is using. They look like humans, but they have like these huge like veins like sticking out of their heads, connecting them to something. Uh, so there's the group that's in place to find the cargo is on the planet, and then there's the group that's on the ship. Uh, the group that's on the ship. The mechanic is still trying to figure out why the atmosphere is making it snow on the ship. So he's he's been working on stuff. Um, and then he starts talking about a significant other that is back home and how every time they, you know, they're kind of talking about how they regret going on these trips sometimes because, you know, they're, they leave Earth or they leave their home planet and the person that's staying on the planet gets older and they don't age because they do the cryogenic sleeping. Um, and as he's doing this, part of the paneling breaks off and it reveals that it's, it's his husband or boyfriend and um, he's there, but he's part of the machine. He has like wires sticking out of him, part of the ship. And he grabs him and infects, he infects him as well, the mechanic. Um, so they basically, the Borg type, it's almost like a Borg character, I guess. It reminds me of yeah. Star Trek um, with like the tech integration, but they, they get out, they're heading off the ship and uh, the Borg that was on the ship gets shot by the people that are looking for their mechanic on the ship. But then the other one, the the mechanic that's been infected and looks like a zombie almost, gets stabbed with a spear in the head, and we find the indigenous people of this planet that we see in the, the beginning of the first issue. I almost forgot about them. So there's actually, like, alien beings that are almost humanoid-looking. They're the same size of humans and stuff that are still residing and making sacrifices on this planet. So... Colin Bunn, man, he's 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 doing it. He's uh, I'm hooked on this book. The reveal of the of those um, aliens, I completely forgot about. First, he the way he did that from issue one to two, I was like, oh damn, I completely forgot about those guys in the beginning of the first issue. So I thought it was yeah. a solid second issue. Yeah, the book is really good. Yep, and the art the art is amazing. It's very uh, disturbing at some time, at some point. So. But that was all I had. So you didn't have Justice League number 47? Oh my god, did I miss that one again? You talk about it. So this was the Sunday night special uh, Justice League. Um, it was the end of the story. And oh, okay. nice. they all like apologized to each other for the bad things they said two issues ago. And mm. then that helped defeat the evil person and bring back Spectre. And then they all stood in the Hall of Justice and were like, hey, we shouldn't be mean to each other anymore. I like your description better. Maybe I don't need to read this. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it, I'm, I love Venditti. We both yeah. do. Yeah. That was a weak ending. I'm sorry. It's almost like they made him end it, you know? I don't almost, know. yeah. Oh. Uh, Thor number five. This is uh, Thor and Galactus are finally enter the, the Black Winter and mm -hmm see that it's a person behind there and the whole issue is uh thor confronting the black winner who is bringing his old enemies to uh vision to him and talks constantly about like how you're gonna die and what happens and there's a huge reveal at the end um anyone that knows marvel lore knows that Galactus is actually a being that is left over from a previous universe that was destroyed to make way for the current universe. Um, and we find out that... So, they've been telling us that Black Winter was the one that destroyed that universe and that Galactus saved him. Mm -hmm. We end up finding out that's not what happened. Galactus was the, the Black Winter's herald oh. in this old universe. So, it was a very awesome reveal... And I, I didn't know how Donny Cates was going to come and do Thor after the amazing Jason Aaron run we had. But I got to say, these first five issues are killing it. Awesome. I absolutely loved it. Um, Star Wars Bounty Hunters, number three. Uh, this whole issue is uh, Valiant's fighting Bosk. Mm -hmm. 
That's basically the issue. It's great. It's Star Wars with no lightsabers, and it's that's some of the best Star Wars to me. Um, a lot of bounty hunter stuff. It's just page after page of action. Um, nice. I really like this series. I think we'll just check it out. Oh, the disappointment. Um, oh, no. <laughs> book I was most looking forward to this week, Marvel Snapshots Captain America number one, written Uh-oh. by Mark Russell. Uh-oh. So, oh, every, wow. everything here leads to Chris is going to love this book. Um, the big problem with this book, Captain America shows up on three pages. I counted them. Three wow. pages. The whole issue is about this uh, kid who, a uh, black kid in like uh, a slum part of New York. Mm-hmm. And this bomb goes off. It ends up turning everybody into like these angry zombies. It's almost like uh, crossed, but not quite as <laughs> graphic. <gruesome. laughs> yeah. Um, and Captain America saves them. And then the kid, because of all the, the things that happened, um, his dad tells him that he can't go to college. So then AIM shows up and says, hey, we can help you out. He becomes part of AIM. Finds out they're the one that built the bomb. He destroys it, and Captain America goes, good job, son. Um, it's basically a story about impoverished areas and how some that we forget about these areas in our community. The moral of the story is great, but my problem is, is I wanted a Captain America story. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. Um, so it's not a bad book. It's just a disappointing book because it wasn't what I wanted out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the art's okay. I just yeah, I really really so wanted. Sad. I feel bad. I <laughs> wanted a good Captain America. Book. I would want Bat. I mean, Batman showed up at three pages. That's like what is that? I don't know. Like five percent of the entire book. Not it's, even ten percent. Yeah, it's just it's so unfortunate. <laughs> um, Batman Beyond number forty four. So, we're at the point, man, beyond where they no longer have the Batcave. Mm-hmm. Bruce built this skyscraper just to turn it into its own Batcave. And then he's got stupid technology around to disguise it from people. Mm-hmm. Comic book stuff. Um, yeah. But So, this all sets up the fact that the League of Assassins are trying to kill Damien. And we find out that they've been taken over by a rogue agent inside the League of Assassins, whose entire plan is to leave Earth, create a new Ice Age, come back, and then remake the Earth in their own image. Makes sense. You know, League of Assassins stuff. Um, so they they find Damien basically in Death's door, and they bring him back to the Bat Suite, whatever they're calling it, and um, bring him back to life. And through all this, there's this backstory with the whole Batwoman thing, which I had talked about in the past. Uh, there was a whole story arc where Terry was gone. There's a Batwoman. And she finds her new suit, and we kind of get teased that she's going to be coming into the story soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like Batman Beyond. Uh, Dan Jurgens is writing it, so it's, it's good stuff. Uh, this story arc in particular is just like... It's just a setup story. <laughs> it's really like, let's put them in the Bat Suite... Let's bring Damien back real quick. We'll introduce Batwoman, and then we can move on to better things. Cool. But still pretty good. Okay. Avengers Empire number zero. Empire's here, everybody. I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> this whole story is just setting up what Empire is going to be, which yeah. is basically to say that the Kree and the Scroll have merged to create a mass empire, and they're going to come to destroy... Um, this other race and this race is a it's almost like a race of swamp thing it's like Hmm. plant-based people okay and um it brings back swordsman who's been dead for like 40 years in comic lore uh it gets the avengers to realize who this race is and why they're important and what they need to do there's a lot of really good things here um i thought it was fun it was just a quick setup. There's going to be another zero issue with the Fantastic Four, uh, and then we'll get into the big Empire story. But I'm just so happy because I am a sucker for a good comic event story, mm-hmm. and I'm ready for uh, Empire to be here to read. Nice. And I got one last one, um, a super indie comic from Behemoth Comics. I completely forgot I ordered this, but I'm glad I forgot because it's a good surprise. 
Nice. Uh, the Osiris Path. So this whole book is about this archaeologist in the 1980s who is brought into the space program and shot into a, a rocket to go to the moon just to find out that we've had a secret base at the dark side of the moon since the 1960s. Um, and the reason that they have the secret base is they found this Egyptian-like temple on the moon. And they found out that not only is it on the moon, but it's on a bunch of different planets as well, including Mars. Hmm. Um, so this whole story was setting that up and like introducing you to things as they come along. And then there's some enemy that they're fighting on the moon we don't know who they are, but they look humanoid. Um, I'm wondering if it's just like going to be the Russians or something, <laughs> which would be yeah. awesome. I'm not going to yeah. lie. Uh, but it was a really good, well-written story. Um, if you have a chance, check it out. Because if you like, you know, Cold War stories with sci-fi elements, it's right up your alley. And I know exactly why I ordered it at the time now that I've read it. But uh, I'm really glad that I got it. Uh, definitely check that out. So that's it for me, Mike. Where can people find you on that internet? You can find me at Fortress Ricker on Twitter. Where can they find you and or the show? They can find me at Fortress Chris on Twitter or at ChrisRunt.com. That's C-H-R-E-S-R-U-N-D-T.com. And as always, you can find everything we do at FortressComicNews.com. Uh, remember, if you are listening to us, give us a five-star review on whatever podcast you're using and leave a review. Uh, it helps us out a lot, and we very much appreciate it. If you are watching us, to like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment down below. Um, that also helps us a lot, and we appreciate it. And if you want extra special go further in life things to do, go to patreon.com slash porchcomicnews, um, where you can give us money, and we give you things to return, including Bat Friends podcast three days early. So thank you all so much for listening. And we'll see you all in two weeks because Mike's going to be gone for a week. Bye. Bye.